that the so idea to kind of like run one? Like it's, is it easier to work in the matrix realm than it is in the ranking realm? Or well, I think the matrix? converse of that, that theorem is almost useless, but uh, it, it's just interesting that if you have a classical ring, then all of the matrix rings are classical. Um, and you know the converse is true that if even one of the matrix rings is classical, then everything has to be. But um, that's probably not very useful. Anyway. What's a ring? <coughs> Doing group under addition. Okay, cool. Is, it, is, it get, is this a big semi group under yeah. um, it It's still not full screen. Do you hit view? <coughs> view? I need to take modern. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I've taken, I've taken a real Full analysis. Screen. There you go. Modern. Modern. All right. All right. This yeah. is Lee Fisher. Hey. He's uh, responsible for the recent presumptive nomination of Trump because he's been rigging geometry and voting. So it's all his fault. <laughs> Make math great again. Really. He's making math great again. He's going to solve the Quintic. Yeah. Yeah. So he's solve the Quintic. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so, that's what we said in Galois there. He's, even though it can't be done, he's going to solve the Quintic. We're going to make the Mexicans do it for us. <laughs> That'd be great. So make math great again. So, uh, well, anyway, geometry and voting. All right. So um, welcome to Smallsbury. It's a very small town. There are about 260 people who live there. And there's three people who are running for mayor of Smallsbury. There's Anna, Bart, and Claire. Conveniently, A, B, and C. Um, and we're very, the Salisbury administration is very worried about having a three-way tie. So worried, in fact, that they have their voters go in and instead of picking their first choice, they go ahead and they pick their first choice, their second choice, and their third choice. Because, so, if it came down to being like a three-way tie completely, they could let the second place choice on the side or maybe the third place choices decide. And what winds up happening is 50 people go in and vote, and they say, Anna's my first choice, then Bart, and then Claire's my second. And the rest give their own preferences like this, right? And this has, this is a list of every possible permutation of the candidates, and there, there are six of them because three factorial is six. But if we had four, then there would be 24 entries in the list. And if there were five, there would be 120 entries in the list, and it would grow factorially long and become very hard to manage with even a handful of candidates. So there's a better way to organize this data, where what we do instead is we say, how many people pick Anna as their first choice? Well, that's these two, which is 110 people. How many people picked her for their second choice, which is these two, which is 40? And then this would be 110. And we resort them into a matrix like this, where we say, okay, there's the first place column. That's how many people pick Anna as their first place. And then this is our first place row column. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> 90 people, first place column. And then 90 people pick Bart as their first place choice. And then so then you'd also have the third place column and the second place column and each candidate's rows, just like so. And it doesn't seem more effective, right? Because we had six here and now we have nine. But when we do this matrix, Reorganization. This squares with the this scales with the square of the number of candidates, while the other one scales with the factorial, which this is actually much more convenient. And now that it's in a box, we could look at it like a matrix and use some matrix algebra, like multiplying it by a vector, where we pick a vector and have some points in it, say w1, w2, and then w3. And um, the convenient thing about how vector multiplication works is that if we take the first column, like the first place choices, and we multiply it by the, the first entry in this vector, that would be like telling us how many points we want to give to a first place vote. And then this would be like telling us how many points we want to give to a second place vote. And a third place vote, and then we would carry it out and add all this up and it would give us a results vector. And then we would say, whoever has the most points wins. So the plurality method, the one we all know and love, the simplest one, the one where you just pick your first choice is actually just a special case of this, this idea of a weighted, of a positionally ranked voting system, is what they're called. Where we'll go ahead and we'll pick one point for our first place choice, zero points for second, zero points for third. And then when we carry it out, we see Anne wins. She has 110 points. She's the most liked person 
on the ticket. And then Claire comes in last. She's the least liked. But here's where it gets interesting. Being the least liked, or being the most liked and being the least disliked are not the same thing. And we can prove this. So instead of saying we want one person for first place, instead of saying we want the plurality, we'll do the anti-plurality where we say we give no points for a first place choice, no points for a second place choice, but a third place choice counts against you. And if we do that, then Claire wins, where she comes out with the one that's the least negative entry. <laughs> and uh, Anna's actually the most hated one. She's a very uh, <laughs> controversial candidate. <laughs> this is very relevant to right am. now. <laughs> so, <and laughs> then here's the real paradox. So, if we go ahead and we like combine these weights, we say, how about, well, what if, I don't want the plurality winner, and I don't want the anti-plurality winner. I want like the the happy medium of these two systems, which is actually called the board account, where we say we'll give one point to first place, zero points to second place, negative one to third. And then when we carry this out, we actually get Bart is the winner now. <laughs> so we come up with three reasonable systems, and they all give us three different answers. And um, it's pretty weird. So, so you can think about it intuitively. Bart is the one who would win, on average, is the most is the most liked on average. Anne is the most liked, and Claire is the least disliked. And then we ask, well, can we generalize this? And what does it really mean? Like, are, like could other ways give us different answers? Is there always a way that we want? What kind of like weight should we restrict our attention to? So, of course, you can generalize it and it generalizes quite nicely. You just have a bigger matrix, you pick more choices for places, and you have more results. And we want to restrict our weights to be reasonable, which means they have to be decreasing. You can't give, like it wouldn't make any sense if you said, all right, first place gets negative one point, last place gets one point. That is not fair. <laughs> and you could, you could cause candidates who are universally disliked to win. So. Restricting your attention to reasonable ways forces whatever kind of winner comes out of this, somebody's gonna like them. <laughs> Usually a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Can't win, nobody likes you. So, so we have these reasonable weights. And then we ask, well, what weight is the most reasonable? And I don't think that question really has a good answer. And uh, really, you could say all the weights, all the reasonable weights are equally reasonable. And what we want is the candidate who would win over the greatest portion of distinct reasonable weights choices. And you don't know what distinct means yet, so I'm going to tell you. Um, what it means for the weights to be distinct is that if you take two weights, if you take a weight and then you scale it by a positive scalar, so like you have all the possible weights choices in R3, and you take one and it gives you some outcome, and you scale it like you stretch it away from the origin, that's just because the preference matrix is a linear thing, that's just going to scale the outcome by the same factor. So we could restrict all of our all of our weights to just stick to a sphere. And then that would be all the distinct weights would be the ones that lie on a sphere, and we pick the sphere of radius one particularly, because it's nice. But there's also um, another nice aspect of this structure. We well, remember um, I think I forgot to point this out, but the, the nice things about the fully ranked profile matrix is that if you add up all the entries in the row or column, of any row or column, you get the same number, which is the number of people who vote. And so if we take these uh, weights and we add to them a number, this time it doesn't have to be positive, and we distribute, we can distribute this uh, preference matrix over the sum, and we get this guy. And what's really nice about it is since all this row sums and column sums are the same, when we multiply it by this constant vector, all it does is just shift the results, and that doesn't change our ordering either. So you can say that this guy is k times the all ones vector, and if we take any weight and we add to it a multiple of the all ones vector, that doesn't change anything. So we could restrict our attention to one affine space, which is orthogonal to the all ones vector, where what we'll 
actually do is we'll just pick the subspace that's called the sum zero subspace, which is all vectors that are perpendicular to the all ones vector. So I have a nice picture of it here. Here in black, we have the all ones vector pointing off into space. Here in blue, we have the sphere, the unit sphere. And here in red, we have the sum zero subspace, where we could stick to picking weights on the sphere, or we could pick weights in the sphere, or we could pick weights in the sum zero space only, or in the sum zero space and the sphere. Those will all give us the same kind of ideas about which proportions, like who would win by the greatest proportion because of all these symmetry conditions we have. Lee, does that say that your weights have to be ascending, but they also have to stack to get to on this. the unit sphere? And the, yeah. Yes, so when they're, when they're reasonable, right? Reasonable, just pick them off the unit sphere. Reasonable, and so, so when we want them to be reasonable, right? We have to pick which axis corresponds to which weights. So like if this green axis is like our first place weights, and then this red axis is second place weights, and this blue axis is third place weights, then this induces us to stick to picking things. That when we pick things are reasonable, that means we have to pick out of one of these six symmetric pieces, and one of them is the reasonable region. It just depends on how we order the axes, which, which axis goes with which weight. So now we restrict your attention a little further. When we do reasonableness, we just stay like in like one piece. The reasonable piece. And so I put another picture of this reasonable space right there. So now if we want to take things back to Smallsbury, we're going to have to come up with a basis for the sum zero subspace to make our calculations a little easier. Um, it's not that bad. It looks scarier than it actually is. So we have so when we regularly do math with a basis, you just have like x hat and y hat as your basis. But here I have these u hat and e hat, and they're almost the same. So they're both unit vectors, and they're orthogonal. And I can take, I can parameterize the sum zero subspace by taking scalar multiples of them and adding them together with these a's and b's, and then we have this and this. So if we want to pick a weight in the sum zero subspace, all you have to do is find the a's and b's that'll scale you to that point. And so if we want our weight to be reasonable, or if we want our weight to lie inside the sphere, all we need to do is restrict a squared plus b squared to be less than one. And if we want it to be reasonable, this actually leads us to making this restriction on what the a's and b's can be about. And um, you'll go ahead and we take this thing, a hat times u plus b hat times b, and we multiply it by this matrix we had of the, the preference matrix from the Smallsbury election and you get all these things with the radicals and everything. But here's what it looks like, actually. Um, when we had these equations right here, we had to set, like, we had to figure out where they would tie. So that would give us the boundaries for their winning regions, like which pieces of this reasonable space they would win. So we'd set them equal to each other. And solve for the tying regions, and then we would just try points between them to find the regions which um, it looked like this. And so you can see, this is the sum zero subspace, what we're looking at. And you have choices in U going this way, and choices in B going this way. And this green piece right here is Anna's winning region. So if we were to pick a weight lying in this piece of the sum zero subspace, Anna would win on that. And if we picked a weight here, Bart would win. And if we picked a weight here, Claire would win. And so these regions are unbounded, but we can still compare them by just comparing their angle, right? So like, um, because they have this radial symmetry, so we just go ahead and we measure the angle, and we get Anna has 0.4 radians, Bart has 0.39 radians, and Claire has 0.24 radians. So Anna wins, not by a lot at all, just barely wins. So I talked all about, all about three dimensions. It turns out that we can't extend this. And this calculation about parameterizing the sum zero subspace becomes much less helpful when we have many candidates like five and when we go to San Francisco. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to talk about this and sort of apply it to a real world election and see if we could find one that our system would work on 
and see how we would extend it. And what we found is for the District 10 representatives of San Francisco in 2010, they all ran. These, these five people ran to represent District 10. And what the city of San Francisco did is they had their voters pick the top three choices. And we ran into some issues where some of the voters would go in and they would just pick a first place choice. Or more strangely, some would go in and just pick a second place choice. They <laughs> 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 maybe didn't understand what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, we didn't know what to do with this. So the first instinct was, okay, everybody who doesn't list an entire fully ranked profile, let's just throw all this out. And that was what I did. And I got this. And we had, in the, in the Smallsbury election, we had all the row sums and column sums coming to the same number, which was pretty nice. And I said, well, if we want to continue this, we don't know what their last place choices is, and we have to kind of infer that. So what we could do is we could just go by this assumption, we want all the row sums and column sums to be equal, but that still doesn't give us enough linearly <coughs> independent equations to figure out what these question marks are. So I said, the last two columns are the same column. And that takes us from here to here, when we make this assumption, right? And it's kind of nice. So now we have all the row sums and column sums are the same. So if we restricted our attention to the sum zero subspace, it would be the same. But it turns out that for running this with a computer, which is what I had to make uh, the computer program to write this to do, it isn't really that much efficient to, to restrict your attention to the sum zero subspace because you just lose like one parameter. And I thought that the code would be more elegant if we just stick to the sphere and not the sum zero subspace. So what I had to do is I wrote a program that would pick a million random weights just that lie in the reasonable region and on the sphere. And that was already, that was kind of a challenge actually because my first instinct was to just pick a million points just in the cube in five dimensions and then everything that wasn't reasonable or in the sphere I threw out. And it was terrible, it was terrible. I lost, um, I like, for every, I think I kept about one in 240 points with that. Because the probability of being reasonable was really like, it's really unlikely, like it's one in five factorial for five candidates. And then um, I think it was Dr. Goski helped, where I was thinking, how do I randomly pick them, but also make them decreasing? And he says, you could just sort them. Yeah, and so then um, I picked them all in the, in the cube, and then I just sorted them and threw away everything that wasn't in the sphere. And that was better, where I only lost half of them. But I still didn't figure out how to pick points uniformly just on the sphere. And that was later I read um, a result that was a sort of like a, one of the results of the either, where like a lot of people had referenced it and used it, but I, I couldn't figure out where it came from. But it was really cool if I pick a vector with um, entries who, who's with the uh, random entries where each entry is a uniformly distributed random variable with mean zero and variance one. Normal. Normally distributed. Uh, yeah. But with mean zero and variance one, and then I take all those factors and I just divide them by their lengths, they'll actually lie uniformly on a sphere now, even though I pick them with normally distributed entries. And so I do that, I pick them normally distributed, and then I sort their entries, and I don't have to throw away any points. And so I ran this election with a million randomly selected voting, randomly selected weights, just random, reasonable weights. Um, the outcome was will, will shock you. Are you ready? <laughs> this person wins all one million of them. Like, wow. Wow, all of them. I remember I was kind of shocked when I ran it on my computer. Um, it like sat there for like five minutes and just thought and thought and thought and thought and then said, okay, she wins a million random weights and nobody else wins any of them. Will you run me through the numbers again? The first, I mean, is that, million. did that surprise you? It did it surprise you because? I thought that there would be some kind of weights in which, like when I look at it now, she has just the biggest numbers at the top three, like mm -hmm. across the board and mm -hmm. her last two entries are way smaller than everybody else's. 
So it didn't surprise me a whole lot when I saw the So the first, the, column, wait, the first column is the first place? Yes. Yeah, okay. Second place. So she was the plurality winner anyway. Yeah. But, uh, and oh, well, that makes sense though, because look how un. un yeah. Undisliked. That's Undisliked. That's the problem. It's in the yeah. 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 And where did those last two come from, Lee? Remind me. Oh, these two? I didn't know. So I just made the assumption that since they weren't recorded, voters are equally likely to switch their fourth place and fifth place preference because they didn't ask them. So I just said, okay, their fourth and fifth place choices are the same. And in order to get all row sums and column sums to be the same, I was able to infer that these extra two columns. She's enough extra equations to fill them in. Yeah. Because they didn't say what fourth and fifth are, they just say at random assign those. Just yeah. make them equal. That's what you need for. Yeah. If you made a different assumption with that, yes, it will change. Would that the dislike number go up? I mean, because that seems to win the win the day for this person, right? The, the dislike? Yeah. There are more the slides dislike. still, I believe. Uh, so there are still more have... slides. Oh. Yeah, she's going to win. Yeah. The plurality method, no she wins the plurality method no matter what. But um, it's kind of interesting when you interpret it this way, you would have to be unreasonable to say that anybody else should win. <laughs> like, that's yeah. that proved it. Um, so, but I thought about it, and what if we tried to do something differently? Where I didn't use the sum zero subspace to do the calculation, and the only thing I needed all row sums and column sums to be the same for was for that, for the sum zero space election to be the same as the regular one. So what I didn't said was, this time, where they had partially ranked ballots, like if they just picked a first place choice or just picked a second place choice, I just put those in, like as just incremented it by one. And then these last two columns, I just zeroed them out. I just went by naively, all the data I had, no assumptions, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And it comes out about a little differently, where um, Mary Cohen, who's this, this top one right here. She still wins, and she wins by like 86% of random reasonable ways to choose her. But um, this guy, Ed Donaldson, who I think is uh, this one, also wins a little. And Tony Kelly, who is the most obscure one, hmm. before we threw away the partially ranked, after that, after we had thrown away partially ranked choices, he wasn't even scoring in the thousands, but he still gets like a handful of votes. And, um, we think that like, since we didn't count people choosing him, like we didn't count fourth and fifth place choices against him, whereas before mm -hmm. he had like these huge numbers yeah. down here that were that were causing him to never win. Mm -hmm. Here he's not being penalized. So if you if you ran votes that had very like numbers like zero here and like negative one here, he would win actually. So he's not he is he's not penalized. Okay, so, so he's the last row? Yeah. And who's the other one? Ed is middle. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, is, yeah, so you, no. It's interesting that the fourth place, that the fourth person down, uh, you can see that they have like that increasing nature. You know, they're, they're going from less first than second and third choices. So yeah. it makes sense that they're not going to be very popular. But you kind of almost believe that the person in the second row is the beat out obscure guy. Yeah. That's interesting. Let me try this. Ed Donaldson. Yeah. I think you have him in the right order. There's some labels on the matrix. I should probably label these matrices. Yes. I know Amelia Cohen wins, and she she's actually the district. She she won the plurality in is the actual winner. <laughs> Thankfully. <sense. laughs> Thought the Tony Kelly. So that it kind of uh, brings you to a philosophical question about the anti-plurality might have something maybe wrong with it, maybe right with it. Because Tony Kelly won by being obscure. <laughs> and uh, you might think that that's, like, you could say that that's bad because you don't want somebody who just a couple of people to know about to just show up and win, but you also don't want people who have huge campaign uh, financing programs to just dominate the discussion also. So there's like a, a lot of all of these voting theory like questions and problems are all like double-edged swords secretly. 
Um, so things to take away from this is that we can use MathMag to generalize voting systems. And I was uh, talking with Dr. Cook about this. I remember when I had a earlier today. I remember when I first picked this project about two years ago. Um, Dr. Klima had said we could do algebra or we could do voting theory. And I was thinking like Thanksgiving dinner with the extended family. My uncles are gonna <laughs> sit down and say, tell me what research are my tax dollars paying for? And uh, I wanted something I could explain to them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I ran into the same problem actually. Once I told them voting, my, um, my Uncle Brian says to me, he's like, voting? What's so complicated about that? Vote. And uh, we did have an interesting discussion about it, and I told him about exactly how mathematics could generalize voting systems and point out paradoxes in how we count votes. And the big idea is maybe the day-to-day -day voter might not understand this election machinery fully. Like, they would totally understand how to submit the ballot. But I think that one way that this, this thing could be used is to determine how like legitimate your case is for winning. Because it could be that you win the plurality, but you would lose everywhere else. And that would be like, or you would lose like not, like you wouldn't win a lot of the reasonable region. You just win like a little slice near the plurality. And that, that might <laughs> that also, that might say uh, your case is, is, is more anomalous. Like it's like you won more as a factor of the voting system than less as you were the popular choice. And yeah. So I just think so. So did you get thoughts at doing this with the uh, Republican primary bill when there were 14 candidates? <laughs> People no, said it, but, but the, there aren't exit polls that give rank rankings. Yeah. So actually, when it dwindled down to three, I think that we can There's collect some, data yeah, yeah. because they don't ask you to rank them, but they ask who you like the most and who you like the least. And with three candidates, I think that's almost yeah. impossible. Before Cruz yeah. dropped out about a month ago, I remember Trump was the plurality winner, yeah. and Kasich was actually the Yankee plurality winner. Yeah. <laughs> um, and probably yeah. Cruz was the third one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. So every time I hear uh, this is a cool talk, but every time I hear it, it all comes down to the weights. Yeah. Right. I mean, whether or not it's the the, the class doctor again teaches on the sports or this kind of stuff, it comes down to some linear combination. How do you choose the weights? Yeah. So you weighted it according to like a sphere, right? Or the yeah. weights come on a sphere. Come on, a sphere. He didn't and actually choose the weights. He didn't choose the weight. No, he randomly selected a million of them so, so the that they were you consider all weights. All reasonable weights. All reasonable weights, and all the reasonable weights are the points. You look the at sphere. proportions. Which who, who went? What proportion of reasonable weights makes you win? Yes, and whoever exactly. had the largest proportion of reasonable weights, you could declare them yes. actually. The and winner. reasonable. So it's an interesting one. This means you get more points for first than for second. Like you wouldn't ever say. A vote for first place is worth one point, but if you get voted for second place, you get two points. That wouldn't be reasonable. No, no, yeah. So that that I get. So I'm still trying to understand the the sphere. All the, sphere. the weights, the the weights squared sum have to be. Am I thinking about that correctly? Just scale. You just, just scale it down to the sphere. We just yeah, you just so, take the sum yeah. of all the weights and just. But then what does that sym that symmetry of imposes on you? So right before we have just every. Weight, every reasonable weight choice, which is actually like unbounded, like it's yes, yes, it's that's a yes thing. Yeah. And you've shown via this result that you can just restrict down to the sphere. You can right? actually restrict in that case down to the unit circle. But to the unit circle, yeah. So the uh, the thing was is that if you pick two weights, yeah, and one of them is a scalar multiple of the other, they'll always get the same outcome. So we don't lose anything. Yeah. Think of it about right. Should we really be using a Euclidean norm? I think that's what I'm trying to yeah. get. Because I'm wondering what the like symmetry of this, a, like more of like a, a, a max, yeah, um, square metric, a one one norm where you're just adding this one. So hmm. yeah, see, I'm I'm thinking, I'm wondering about the symmetry imposed by the sphere, and wonder if that that allows like this last person to kind of be equal. 
I know you want to count things equally, but I would think that yeah, yeah, there should be some sort of some ellipsoid or something. So something that weights. Because I would say you don't necessarily want the the weights to the sum of the squares to be one. Wouldn't you? You just want the sum of the weights to be one. Just that you know, and and. Sum of squares. Sum zero would make them zero. So I think that what he's saying is that from the middle condition, right. you can think of like you can scale them all down shells that. around the origin as mm -hmm. all giving the same result. Mm -hmm. So you could look at any shell and figure out what's going to happen for all shells. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's the. Uh, I think that's the idea. <coughs> it's it's a, like things that get really dull for the execution. Yeah. So when I came, in, when I, I did this, right. If you look at um, like these things that I call radial symmetry, mm -hmm. yeah, these regions have radial symmetry and they'll always have radial symmetry. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea, is that you restrict your attention to a sphere because if you want to measure these three unbounded things, does that make sense? Does make sense? you just measure their angles. Because multiplying, multiplying the vector by a constant doesn't change the ranking. You get, this, you get the same winner. Yeah. Every weight that's a constant multiple of another weight is going to give you exactly the same winner. So every sphere. Yeah, and if you multiply it, you can just shrink it down. You're going to yeah. get the same winners as you move out. So you're thinking of a point on the sphere as a the single coordinates weight. being the weight, the, the, yes. the components yeah. for the weight? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I would say, I, uh, yeah. See, that's. I, I mean, yeah, I guess that. that hmm. It just to me strikes me as an odd choice because computationally you're making like difficult. It is true that if you could think of it differently, it would be so, better. So um, what I was always worried about, though, is something like a sphere. Like if I if I picked some other shape to restrict my attention to, would I count like I would count some reasonable weights like more than others, or like like if I had like square or something like in a small sphere, might be counted more heavily. So I and mean, I, I just kind of think like you want to for every class of like reasonable weights, you yeah. want one representative, you right. want a unique yes. representative. To me, the easiest thing to do is to take the bottom weight, shift it up to zero, and then scale it down so it has height one. So you did that, you got a different actually, result. I did this actually in a... See, that's what I was wondering. Do you want the weights have to add to one, or do the sum squared have to add to one? I mean, like, I, some see, squared. to me, that sounds like, that computationally would be an easier thing to do. You get and a different result. Yeah. And so if you get different yeah. results, that makes me concerned that yeah. maybe maybe the random selection, something's off with that. No, because he did it in the three candidate case, so there's no randomness there. Yeah, he did it I select. by hand. He oh, you did it by the hand. Line that it's on the angle. Mm -hmm. It was just a dot line. So when you scale them like that, right, you scale the top one to be one and the bottom one to be zero and just choose decreasing in that way. You get like a No, not the top to be one. The sum of the three points to be one. Yeah, the sum to be one. So yeah, see, that's what I think. It'd be hard to do this voting thing. I I, I think if I'm a voter and I go to the box and I say, <laughs> okay, do I like 